Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. And welcome to the 2015 HSJ Annual Lecture. My name's Alistair McClellan. I'm the editor of HSJ and your MC for this evening. Should anybody want to tweet this evening's proceedings, which we encourage, please use the hashtag HSJ Lecture. A few housekeeping notes before we begin. Please put your mobiles on silent. Uh, we're filming tonight's proceedings for broadcast later this week, and as you'll see, we also have the cameras here from Sky. Finally, we will have about 20 minutes or so after the lecture for questions and debate, so please prepare to contribute. This is the second HSJ annual lecture. The first was given by NHS Chief England Chief Executive Simon Stevens last December. The venture is still new enough, therefore, to remind you why we decided to create the lecture. The purpose of the lecture is to give UK healthcare a high-profile platform from which one of the country's leading um, health policy thinkers can set out their thoughts on the future direction of the NHS. Outside healthcare, there are a number of examples, the most famous one being the uh, Chancellor's Mansion House speech. The NHS, the most respected and admired institution in this country, ensuring one of the defining characteristics of our nation surely deserves the same. Last year, Simon used uh, the first HSJ annual lecture to set out the implementation for the five-year forward view. He was always going to be a very hard act to follow, but in this year's lecture, I believe we have more than met that challenge. The HSJ annual lecture is a partnership with FTI Consulting, who have played a vital role in so rapidly establishing its place in the health policy calendar. To more fully introduce FTI, and finally our lecturer himself, please welcome Senior Managing Director, Jonathan Guppy. Good afternoon, everybody. I am delighted to welcome you all to the second HSJ annual lecture, uh, supported once again by FTI Consulting. Um, after the success of last year's lecture with Simon Stevens, we're delighted to once again be associated with such an important event, which we believe has rapidly become a cornerstone of the health service calendar. Now, this is we think clearly reflected by the size and importance of this audience this afternoon, and so let me start by thanking you all for coming uh, to this event. Now, despite the beautiful and historic setting for this afternoon's event, it would, of course, be nothing without an influential speaker, and there can be few more influential than the current, in the current health climate than the Secretary of State, the Right Honourable Jeremy Hunt, who will shortly be addressing us. Um, and we're enormously grateful to Jeremy for agreeing to speak this afternoon. Thank you, Jeremy. I'd also like to thank the HSJ and its uh, editor, Alistair, for arranging the lecture. Alistair, we are delighted to partner with you on this event, and we look forward to working together in the future. Now, in the last two years, FTI, since it arrived in the UK, has been building a team of specialists with diverse skills, uh, operational management, economical skills, financial specialists, and clinicians, all of them bringing deep personal experience of the health sector, and all of us who can draw upon the, the, the long-established track record of our colleagues in the US. Now, we've got several senior colleagues here this afternoon. It'll be absolutely no surprise to you whatsoever that we'd be delighted if you uh, managed to have a chat with some of us over a drink after the speech this afternoon. Now, one of the things that unites all of us as a team is a strong passion for the health service, and a determination to bring fresh perspectives to the development of the NHS. So just like you, uh, we're particularly keen to hear more about the Secretary of State's vision for the NHS this afternoon. So without any further delay, please would you join me in welcoming the Secretary of State, the Right Honourable Jeremy Hunt. Jeremy, over to you. Given what's happening in the Labour Party now, I may not be the most interesting Jeremy in British politics, but... I do want to talk about the most interesting issue in global health care. And this is something that I believe we'll all be talking about long after new models of care, accountable care organisations, and any of the current hot topics have long become too normal to be interesting. I'm talking about the inescapable, irreversible shift to patient power that is about to change the face of modern medicine beyond recognition. And I want to talk about how this can ease pressure on frontline doctors and nurses already working incredibly hard 
by creating a stronger partnership between doctor and patient that leads to better outcomes. Emma Hill, the editor of The Lancet, said that every patient is an expert in their own chosen field, namely themselves and their own life. Doctors now regularly find patients who know more than they do about their rare disease in a way that fundamentally changes the dynamic between doctor and patient to a partnership, or even one where the patient is the boss. Perhaps the most eloquent exponent of this change is Professor Eric Topol in his latest book, The Patient Will See You Now. He describes it as the death of medical paternalism and the democratization of healthcare. These changes are being driven by technology and our ability to use data differently. And although healthcare has lagged the travel, retail, and banking sectors in embracing what is possible, we're now on the cusp of changes in modern healthcare that will be as profound for humanity as the invention of the internet. Changes that will be as welcomed by doctors as by patients, given the evidence-based improvements in care that follow when patients take more responsibility for their health outcomes. Now, it won't surprise you to know that I want our NHS to get there first. It may surprise you, however, to know that with the British people and the government's strong commitment to NHS values, with the extra £10 billion being invested in the NHS during this parliament, I believe that we are well placed to do so. And it may surprise you even more that I believe that by running faster towards that destination, we are more likely, not less, to be able to cope with the huge pressures doctors and nurses face on the front line now. Last month, I met Michael Milken, the Wall Street junk bond trader who went to prison, became a philanthropist, and is now a major funder of cancer research. I asked him what advice he would give his grandchildren about how to lead their lives. And he said, think of the world as it will be, not as it is now. So how will the world of medicine look in a decade's time? Take people with complex long-term conditions. Many of them are prescribed a confusing cocktail of medications, each with a different set of instructions, which make it easy to forget or mistake doses. So a British entrepreneur living in California has invented a microchip the size of a grain of sand to make these patients' lives easier. This chip is attached to every pill you swallow and is activated by the liquids in your stomach so that your phone records exactly which medicines you've actually taken. Early evidence suggests this could result in significant behavior change by patients, notably much better adherence to drug regimes. In one study, nearly 40% more patients reached their target blood pressure when using the digital pill. Or think about those suffering from mental illness. An app called Ginger has now been developed, which advocates say can detect depression or suicidal tendencies with greater accuracy than a psychiatrist. Without even being opened, this app monitors whether you got out of bed, if you skip a meal, and if you're texting or calling friends in line with normal social activity. By tracking what an average day looks like for that patient, the app detects deviations from the norm and alerts clinicians or relatives when they should check in to see how you're doing. Or take a child with earache. At the moment, his or her parent has to book an appointment with a GP, travel down to the surgery and get their child's ear checked for infection with an otoscope. But now entrepreneurs have developed a simple attachment for an iPhone which can take an incredibly powerful and accurate picture inside someone's ear. This means with two clicks, the parents can send an image to their doctor and with e-prescriptions and home delivery, the problem can be rectified without stepping outside your home. Time and money are saved 
and that family's consumer experience is revolutionized. And in some ways, this is just the onward march of modern technology finally taking place in healthcare. But these changes are doing something more. All of them are giving patients much greater control of their own health care and responsibility for their health outcomes. So is this good or bad for doctors? US health tech entrepreneur Vinod Kostler says that soon we will never ask a doctor for a diagnosis. Somewhat provocatively, he asks, why would you trust a human brain to make a judgment when a single drop of blood contains 300,000 biomarkers that can be analyzed by a computer before you even have any symptoms. More likely than his prediction is a partnership between a doctor's judgment and the information provided by data analysis. Whilst the best computer chess program can now beat the best human player, it has not yet defeated a human working in partnership with a computer. And that partnership will seem blindingly obvious when it happens. Like the transition in tennis from depending on linesmen at Wimbledon to using Hawkeye, the move to the quantified self in medicine presents a huge opportunity to improve the quality and accuracy of a diagnosis. Perhaps the most high-profile example of this is Angelina Jolie choosing to have a double mastectomy after genetic sequencing. But it's also clear in an era of chronic conditions, when patients take responsibility for managing their condition, the outcomes are better. The expert patient program showed that after training patients to self-manage conditions, 40% felt reduced pain, tiredness, or breathlessness within months. Some, reduced, some reported a reduced use in NHS services, such as GP consultations and hospital visits. Likewise, when it comes to lifestyle decisions, like obesity or relating to smoking, doctors cannot be held responsible. But working with patients who are prepared to take responsibility, they can transform life chances. No one disagrees with this, so now it's time to move away from the ivory towers of theory to the gritty job of implementation. Today I'll therefore talk about this government's plan to make this happen and the four elephant traps we need to avoid in the process. But first let's look at our progress to date. Over the last few years, we've been pursuing an ambitious digital strategy in the NHS. Three years ago, I, perhaps foolishly, said I wanted the NHS to go paperless by 2018. I'm sure that someone somewhere will be able to find a lone sheet of paper in use in three years' time. But the spirit of that ambition remains alive and well, not least thanks to the inspirational leadership of Tim Kelsey and his team at NHS England. For example, last year, the number of GP practices offering access to summary GP records rose from 3% to 97%. And in the last two years, the number of practices offering e-booking and e-prescribing rose from 45% to 99%. Take up from the public is still lower than we want but from April next year, all patients will be able to access their full GP electronic record and not just a summary. By 2018, this record will include information from all their health interactions across the system. And by 2020, it will include interactions with the social care system as well. By then, patients won't just be able to read their medical record, but also add their own comments. They'll be able to link it to wearable devices like Fitbits or Jawbones. And as important as the improvements in clinical care that come from electronic health records is the cultural change that comes from transparency. In January, the World Wide Web Foundation ranked the UK first in the world for open data, which includes a health category. Similarly, Professor Don Berwick of the world-renowned Institute for Healthcare Improvement has commended our serious improvement 
to evolving the NHS as a learning organisation committed to the never-ending pursuit of safer care. And this slide now that I'm just about to put up shows how we are now the most open and transparent healthcare system in the world. Across a whole range of categories, you can see that we now give people more access to more data about more topics than other major countries. From a standing start a year ago, the new MyNHS website has drawn together outcomes and performance data across the whole health and care spectrum, from individual consultants, GP surgeries and dentistry practices, to care homes, hospitals, and mental health facilities. The site now holds 700,000 individual pieces of performance data and has been visited 300,000 times, with many of those from the BBC alone. We now have a new look my NHS with much more user-friendly functions and we'll continue improving it to help drive this consumer revolution in the NHS. But we didn't stop with a new website. There's now monthly publication of Never Events, some two and a half million responses to the Friends and Family Test, the new Duty of Candor, the new No Blame Patient Safety Investigatory Service, IPSIS, CQC ratings by hospital departments, GPs soon telling patients about local hospitals' CQC ratings to inform referral choices, Sir Bruce Keogh's review of the professional codes to ensure people are able to report openly and learn from mistakes, and from next March, the publishing of estimated avoidable deaths by hospital. Now, I said in June, this kind of intelligent transparency would not just empower patients, but could also help make the NHS the world's largest learning organization. But whilst we can be proud of our progress in building a patient-focused culture, for anyone who believes in the NHS as passionately as this government does, there is still much work to do. We still put too many obstacles in the way of doctors and nurses wanting to do the right thing. Bureaucracy, as we saw in the video, blurred accountability and a blame culture are still too common. So here are four elephant traps that we need to avoid, followed by some areas that we need to go further and faster to harness the opportunities offered by empowering patients. So firstly, the four elephant traps. And number one is the bureaucracy trap. Surely, people say, technology will help to reduce bureaucracy by eliminating repetitive form filling. Well, not as we saw earlier in parts of the US. Whilst thanks to President Obama's Health Information Technology for Economic and Clinical Health Act, the US has gone further and faster than most countries in digitizing hospital records. This change has met huge resistance from doctors because of the extra burden that can reduce contact time with patients. Put simply, for many doctors, it feels like screen contact has replaced eye contact. One recent US study videoed 100 patient visits and found doctors were spending a third of their time looking at their screens. Another found that emergency room doctors spend 40% of their time filling out online forms and just 28% with patients. An emergency department in Arizona tried to attract applicants by stating on the advertisement that they had no electronic medical records. This was a selling point for the hospital. And in the UK, there are some people who think that the new IT system at Addenbrooke's helped tip that trust into special measures. The lesson here must be to ensure that new IT systems improve rather than reduce clinician productivity so that it helps rather than hinders them in their jobs. Professor Robert Wachter of the University of California, San Francisco, says that this means understanding that the digitization of healthcare is about adaptive change rather than just technical change. 
a change in behaviour rather than just new process. And I'll discuss later the need to get this right in general practice as well as in hospitals. So the first elephant trap is the bureaucracy trap. The second elephant trap is the accountability trap. One of the best reasons for investing in digital records is to allow communication between multidisciplinary teams in different organisations, patients with complex needs. By making cross-team and cross-agency working easier, though, there is also a risk that accountability to the patient is blurred. Let me read you this from a recent report about a tragedy in our NHS. Assurance, it said, had become circular. The CQC had taken reassurance from the fact that the PHSO was not investigating. The PHSO was taking assurance that the CQC would investigate. The SHA was continuing to give assurances based in part on the CQC position. Monitor asked for assurance and received the perceived wisdom. Now let me need you, read you a line from a completely different report about a different tragedy. There was a systemic culture where organisations took inappropriate comfort from assurances given by other organisations. As a result, organisations often fail to carry out sufficient scrutiny of information, instead treating those assurances as fulfilling their own independent organisations. Those were about Morecambe Bay and Midstaffs, respectively, perhaps our two greatest scandals in recent history, with more in common than we've cared to admit. But one of the biggest lessons that I've learned in my time as health secretary is that if the buck stops with six people, it stops with no one. Technology should allow easy communication with the person responsible for your care. But what if no such person exists? We must never let shared records become an excuse for diluted accountability or the lack of a personal touch which is why the work done by the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges about clinical accountability outside hospitals is so important. And I'm absolutely delighted that that guidance has been published today. And it really is excellent guidance. And I, I strongly encourage everyone to spend the time to read it. So accountability is the second elephant trap. The third elephant trap is what I call the cost trap. Computer systems are expensive, and they can also be a total waste of money. Look at the Connecting for Health catastrophe. Nine billion pounds over 10 years came to virtually nothing in our biggest ever IT disaster. Whilst all such investments have the right intentions, many in practice divert resources away from frontline care. And often the investment was targeted at improving organizational convenience rather than patient experience. And the lesson here is surely that incremental improvements closely tied to clinician productivity and patient experience are as valuable as big bang changes, which carry much greater risk. So that's the third elephant trap, the, the cost trap. And then the final elephant trap is the data security trap. We need to be honest. None of this, none at all, will be possible if the public don't trust us to look after their personal data securely. Remember Vinod Kostler's 300,000 biomarkers in a single drop of blood. Who will send their sample to a laboratory if they're worried about the security of highly personal information? The plain truth is the NHS has not yet won the public's trust that it is competent in protecting basic personal information. Hospitals, GP surgeries, and social care organizations do not yet all have proper data security protocols in place. So the new data guidelines being developed by Dame Fiona Caldercott, our National Data Guardian, as well as the CQC's review, both of which will be complete by the end of January, will be absolutely vital. So let's be ambitious when it comes to technology, but let's be humble as well. We haven't always got this right, especially when it has interfered rather than enhanced 
the relationship between doctor and patient. So I am delighted to announce today that Professor Robert Wachter, not only of UCSF, but also author of The Digital Doctor and a world expert on the promise and pitfalls of new IT systems, will conduct a review for the NHS on the critical lessons that we need to get right as we move to a digital future. He will guide and inspire us, as Professor Don Berwick did on safety, and we look forward to receiving his report next summer. So those are four elephant traps to avoid. And now five suggestions as to whether we, where we need to go further to make a reality of patient power. Now, because we've already started on this journey, these five points are more about plugging some gaps in the architecture and making sure that we square the opportunities ahead with the significant financial and operational pressures we face. But if we plug these gaps and stick to the plan, I'm confident, as promised in July, that we really can make NHS patients some of the most powerful in the world. So the first thing we need to do is to plug the transparency gap that we still have. We publish more information than anywhere else, as we've just seen. But we need to go further and, sure that we have, and ensure that we have truly intelligent transparency. That's why the King's Fund report on CCG accountability is so important. And I can announce today that we are pressing ahead with those changes in accordance with the advice that we got from the King's Fund. Now, Chris Ham advised us that aggregated ratings were only possible if human judgment was used to interpret the data we have. So NHS England will provide ratings of all CCGs, similar to the ratings that Ofsted and the CQC provide, in the following categories, outstanding good requires improvement and inadequate. And this will have that element of human judgment that the King's Fund advised was important. And this will help people have a good sense of the quality of healthcare provision in their area and how it comes and how it compares to other localities. By June next year, we'll publish these both as an overall rating and also for cancer, dementia, diabetes, mental health, maternity and learning difficulties. In line with the King's Fund recommendations, the ultimate judgments for these ratings will be made not by an algorithm, but by expert committees. And I'm delighted to announce the names of the people chairing two of those expert committees today. Harpal Kumar of Cancer Research UK will chair the committee looking at the cancer ratings and Paul Farmer of Mind will chair the committee looking at the mental health ratings. The overall CCG rating published next June will use the 2015-16 data, and that will be informed by the current NHS England CCG scoring methodology. However, under Ian Dodge's leadership in NHS England, uh, they will be developing a new methodology based on the wider responsibilities that CCGs now have for their local health economies. And Ian will consult with CCGs on this so that that new methodology is in place from the start of the next financial year to inform the next set of ratings that will be published in June 2017. And we'll also do more to ensure the public get clear information about the quality of their local GP surgery informed by the Health Foundation's work. We should not underestimate the boldness and radicalness of the ambition to publish these ratings about the performance of entire local healthcare economies. This has never been done anywhere else in the world before. And particularly for areas like mental health, it will bring clarity to what has been traditionally a very opaque understanding of the variability of performance. So it is a true world first for our NHS. The second gap that we need to tackle is the accountability gap that I touched on earlier. 
How can patients truly be in control if they don't know where the buck stops for their care? We've made good progress on this front with the introduction of named GPs, names above the bed in hospitals, and the Academy report into named responsible hospital consultants. And we're now going further and hardwiring the principle of named responsible clinicians into planning guidance next year. And today's report from the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges will be another big step forward, as I mentioned. Thirdly, we need to tackle the time gap. Patients will never be powerful if we don't give their doctors enough time to listen to them. Managers will never make the right decisions if they don't have time to listen to their own frontline staff. We need to think about this across the system, but today I'm announcing a four-point NHS England plan to help one group in particular, and that's GPs. Firstly, by cutting down on the ludicrous amounts of time they have to spend chasing different organisations for payment by allowing everyone access to the GP's own payment system. Secondly, to stop the pointless referrals from hospitals back to GPs when they miss an appointment, a total waste of professional time that accounts for around 3% of all GP appointments. Thirdly, we must make general practice truly paperless by 2018 and end the embarrassment that we believe the NHS is currently the world's largest purchaser of fax machines. <laughs> Just two hours a week returned to each GP through rooting out bureaucracy and smarter use of technology is equivalent to a 5% increase in total GP capacity. That must be something worth going for. And finally, we need to support GPs to innovate locally across organisational boundaries. Today, an independent review on the PM Challenge Fund has shown a st statistically significant 15% reduction in minor self-presenting a &E attendances by patients at those practices. This is family doctoring at its best, keeping people happy and healthy outside hospitals. Next, a patient-centred system needs to ask whether it really is giving patients choice and control of their care at every available opportunity. So we'll continue to explore ways to increase choice in maternity, end-of-life care, and the rollout of personal budgets, where NHS England have promised plans before the end of the year. Finally, and most difficult of all, we must continue to tackle the culture gap which still acts as a barrier to putting patients first. Professor Sir Mike Richards frequently expresses astonishment at the variations in care that he's found in NHS hospitals, much greater than he anticipated, with world-class hospitals like Frimley and Salford Royal, alongside 24 other hospitals, which have sadly had to be put into special measures. The CQC say this variation is not principally about money, challenging though the current financial situation is, but about leadership and culture. People become doctors and nurses because they want to do the right thing for patients, but too often a defensive culture makes them pay too high a price for speaking out if they think they've made a mistake or seen others making a mistake. We must accept that there will always be mistakes and sometimes those mistakes will have tragic consequences. But the overwhelming patient interest is in an open and transparent culture that learns from those mistakes and stops them being repeated. And that patient interest is served not just by eliminating variation between hospitals, but within them as well. A patient-centered system cannot justify mortality rates 15% higher for those admitted on a Sunday compared to those admitted on a Wednesday. Hospitals must be allowed to roster according to patient need. And to those who point to low morale as a reason not to change this, I simply say that the highest morale is almost always found at the hospitals that are best at looking after patients. There is no conflict between a motivated workforce and a patient-centered culture. On the contrary, the overwhelming evidence is that they go together 
So we must challenge those who resist improvements that put the patient interest first with the utmost vigour. Technology in healthcare should never be an end in itself. It must be about improving the safety of your baby's delivery, accurately identifying if you're having a heart attack or diagnosing a cancer more quickly. But most of all, it must be about control, about moving away from a culture where you get what you're given to a democratic culture where, for the first time in centuries of medical history, the patient really is the boss. Both the tech optimists and the tech skeptics have plenty of evidence to use, but I am unashamedly one of the optimists. When it comes to the coming changes in healthcare, it's not man versus machine, it's what man and machine can accomplish together. And to that, there really are no limits. Thank you very much. Jeremy, thank you very much. Fascinating stuff. I'm going to go to questions in the audience um, uh, in a minute, but I have one of my own, um, if I may, to begin with. I've always been struck in uh, conversations I've had with you about um, the way that you reference Ofsted, not as just a useful um, uh, um, uh, uh, comparison that other people have in their minds, but as a, as a way that Ofsted changed the public's relationship with, edu with, with education. I wonder how you think these ratings, particularly of CCGs and of um, things like cancer and dementia, etc., how do you expect them to change the relationship um, um, uh, with the, the public's relationship with the NHS? We all know, I've, I've got a six-month-old son, I already know all the uh, Ofsted ratings of the local, uh, the local nursery, and I'll very soon know all the ones for the primary schools as well. I've, it's very clear what action I will take as a result of knowing those Ofsted ratings. What is the comparison in healthcare that holds up to that same level? It's a really uh, central question. And I think the best way to answer this is to look at what the impact has been where we have introduced Ofsted rating in the NHS so far in the last couple of years. So there was a lot of worry when, in the, <coughs> excuse me, in the wake of mid-staffs, we introduced Ofsted star ratings for hospitals and GP surgeries and care homes. People said, what happens if uh, my local hospital uh, gets uh, an inadequate rating and gets put into special measures? Will that mean that no one wants to go to that hospital, that the next door hospital will get flooded with patients and that the hospital that gets put into special measures will go on a vicious, um, get into a vicious uh, cycle of decline? Um, actually, we found the opposite happened. Um, now, there are one or two exceptions to this where we have taken much longer than we wanted to turn around a hospital. But on the whole, we found that putting a hospital into special measures dramatically improved the rate of change. So nine of the 24 have already come out of special measures. And if you talk to uh, people who work at, say, Lincoln Hospital or Tameside Hospital, uh, they say that the immediate impact of special measures, there was an initial dip in morale, because it's obviously a big shock to the system, but then it is like uh, an electric shock to the system. Things start to change much more quickly than they would otherwise have done. Now, so it's a long way to answer your question, and I just want to take a moment, though, because it's so important. So what, is, what was the impact on the public in places like Lincoln, Tameside, uh, Kings Lynn or, or many of the other places, Whips Cross, where hospitals went into special measures. Well, interestingly, far from the kind of uh, you know, violent reaction and people saying we're not going to go to this hospital anymore, in most cases, the public weren't remotely surprised, nor were the people who worked in the hospital, because they knew there were issues that needed to be addressed. In fact, the public were reassured, because they thought now it means something's going to be done about this problem. So... By going one step further and saying that the care that you get for cancer can't just be about the care inside a hospital, it's actually about the whole package of care that extends from primary, community, to acute care, tertiary care as well. If you take those all together, access to drugs, all these things together, um, that's actually the crucial bit of information if someone in your family has cancer. And 
I expect what we'll find is, just as we found with um, hospitals, that there is a surprising amount of variation. And the positive thing is that where the care is outstanding, we'll find that people beat a path to those areas to try and understand what it is that those areas have got right about cancer care and to try and learn from them. And that's what's happened with Salford Royal and Frimley Park and many hospitals that have got good ratings. Um, and where it's not good, I think the public will have confidence that something is going to be done about it because by being brave enough to say publicly that these are the areas where we don't think care is as good as it needs to be, um, you, you prompt rapid behaviour so change. So the ratings are there to, to reassure the public that um, either the services are good or that it has been recognised that services are bad and it's something to do that. You don't expect individual patients to take any specific actions as a result of those ratings. It may happen at the margins, um, but I, that hasn't been our experience to date when we've introduced um, other types of uh, ratings in other areas. Um, what patients want to know, uh, because often, realistically, patients don't have trust. I mean, maternity is one of our areas, and you know, realistically, people will continue to go to their nearest hospital to have their baby. Uh, what they want to know is that improvements are being made, and and that's what I think, I hope the system will develop into a learning culture. I think it's incredibly important that we don't see this as a process of blame. There are no sanctions or penalties that we're announcing, uh, just uh, the opportunity for people to learn. And I think the area I'm most excited about, actually, is mental health, because I do think this is an area where delivery has, has been most opaque. I really don't think anyone now in NHS England... Uh, or in the Department of Health, has a very good idea of where the variations in mental health provision are, both in terms of access and quality of delivery. And this will be a chance to look at that in, a, in an intelligent way, and I think that will be very helpful. OK, right, let's have some questions for the audience. Can I congratulate you on the vision and embracing the digital revolution of healthcare, which, as you know, I've strongly endorsed and encouraged. One of the major blocks... You're quite right, is mindset and culture, not technology. And I worry that the new generation of doctors now in medical schools are getting taught by people who are in the old way, not the new way. But the responsibility for them lies with the Department of Business, not the Department of Health. Isn't it time we shifted that to get some consistency and get the new people trained in the new way? Andy Calder from Health Service General. Um, so I should state, the, whether it's with the Birmingham acute uh, sharing of the chief, chief executive and the chair, or it's with provided chains of hospitals as an option, or whether it's the accountable care organisations like Northumbria, we appear to have a direction of travel with consolidation among providers. How will this new data help patients and the system to make decisions and choices which will actually reward the high quality and help to act on the lesser quality. Thank you. Jeremy Hughes from Outside Society. Thank you, Secretary State. This is good news for the people affected by dementia who, as the CQC report last year, showed fall through the cracks in the pathway all too easily. My concern is to suggest that maybe there's a fifth elephant trap uh, which is that what we end up doing is empowering the easily empowered. What do we do about the people who don't use technology, who don't find it easy to in interpret offset reports, who don't find it accessible, even when we make that information available? How, how can we go further to reach the most dispossessed? Right, so digital exclusion, um, rewarding uh, high quality and um, out-of-touch teachers. Um, OK, well, let me just take those in, in reverse order. Um, Martha Lane Fox is actually doing a report for me at the moment that's precisely looking. So this um, revolution in um, patient empowerment, there are always the early adopters and the pioneers, but you're absolutely right. Uh, we need to make sure that everyone is part of that. And she has championed this, and she is thinking very hard about how we do that. And I think um, in the case of people with dementia, that is a particular priority, because actually technology can be very transformative for people with dementia in making life easier. Um, but, um, you know, being very blunt about it is something that you need to help them 
at the early stages of their condition for obvious reasons. So uh, we are doing a lot of thinking about that, but I think the point is extremely well made. Um, the, um, Andy's point about uh, how will technology help in the consolidation? Well, I think there are some quite um, interesting reasons where this can help. So, for example, uh, University Hospitals Birmingham, uh, which is an excellent hospital, budded with George Eliot Hospital in Nuneaton, which had, I think, 16 different IT systems. UHB has got one of the best hospital pass systems in the country. And um, one of the big benefits of this was that rather than George Eliot having to go through the whole process of procuring a new <laughs> IT system, they could basically just implement the system that UHB already had uh, and shortcut that whole learning process. And I think that is one of the reasons why we do want to encourage chains and partnerships between acute trusts and indeed between GP surgeries so that we don't have to go through this uh, learning process uh, time and time again when actually we've got people who have been very successful in taking forward and they can share it and we want to uh, encourage them to do that. John's point about education is something that we've given a lot of thought to. I think we do have the levers to influence health education because uh, Health Education England, which reports to me, commissions training places and therefore does have a very big influence on what medical schools teach, although that is obviously independently decided by universities. But there is a partnership there. I think um, there is... Uh, there is sometimes some things where you want a new generation to do things that are very different to what's happened in previous generations. I think when it comes to technology, providing we learn the lesson of that video and make sure that technology enhances clinician productivity, I'm very confident that it'll be adopted quite speedily throughout all parts of uh, the profession. But I think where the culture change is most challenging is that parts of medicine, what young doctors say to me is that parts of medicine are quite hierarchical and actually there isn't that culture of speaking out um, and that culture that uh, they have developed in other industries where it's relatively easy to challenge your boss if you think your boss is about to make a mistake or has made a mistake. I think that can be very hard in some clinical environments and that's something that Health Education England are looking at, whether we can give particular support to the next generation of doctors to say, look, this is something we haven't always got wrong in the past, and we want to support you in changing that culture going forward. And thank you. What do you make of your Royal College of GPs? Uh, firstly, can I welcome the announcement of bureaucracy busting? Pleased to see that, and we hope there will be opportunities to take that further. However, um, I do want to uh, come back to you on your Ofsted style ratings for CCG performance. And in the King's Fund report, um, they clearly state that the technical experts they consulted strongly advised against using aggregated measures as these can mask good or poor performance in individual indicators and thus not be meaningful. And I'm afraid I don't see how a committee that then um, puts a, an offset rating um, against this will do anything to mitigate that risk. Thank you very much, Secretary of State, and thank you for acknowledging our access and weight standards in mental health and the efforts we're doing to try to make those world class. Uh, my question is really about how much um, the environment in which people find themselves impact on outcomes. So when I'm thinking about people with all sorts of challenges, the quality of the housing and the support that they are invited to is really critical. Do you have a kind of a mechanism for thinking how you would join it all up? Chief Officer of West Essex CCG, um, share my heart sunk, I have to say, when you announce that. Um, and I think it will be very difficult to bring the talent into CCGs that we need with that kind of thing over their head. What I really wanted to challenge you on was you outlined the opportunity for technology to really challenge the paternalistic culture that can exist in medicine. Um, and I feel that you outlined a fairly paternalistic approach to assurance and oversight in what you set out. I'm a passionate advocate for the power of local people to be disruptive to some of that, and I would really be interested to see how you think the technology, technological revolution can be brought together with local people and communities differently. 
I feel very accountable to the local people in West Essex and I would love them to be part of my assurance process, not just some board numbers on issue today. Right, OK. Aggregated measures, whether they can ever be meaningful, joining up care across um, health, social care, housing, and then um, uh, um, involving local communities in assurance. I think I heard that question. Yeah. Well, I absolutely um, agree with you about involving local communities. In fact, I would say involving patients in assurance process. And I think on many of these individual measures, it's, very, it's going to be very, very important that patient experience... Uh, in different areas is a very critical element of what we look at. But I would be uh, more hopeful than you are about the impact of this kind of intelligent transparency. You are clearly passionate about doing the very best possible job for the people of West Essex, and I salute that. But I think that for the people in your team who are commissioning mental health care and mental health provision, it would be incredibly helpful to have an independent view of what the quality of that provision is compared to neighbouring areas. And that's really all we're trying to do. It is entrenching the principle of peer review um, so that we can have a learning culture. Um, and you may find that actually your, your provision is absolutely excellent. And then your neighbours want to come and see how you've done it. Um, what I think is most likely is you'll find that in some areas it's... Uh, better than average, in some areas it isn't, and then people can learn from each other, and that's really all that this is about. Um, to Maureen's point about aggregation, this is something that we have very extensive discussions with the King's Fund, and essentially we are following the same model that Professor Sir Mike Richards uses for hospitals, where he looks at the, um, the different areas that a hospital operates in, um, comes to a view about the quality of care based both on data and judgment and then comes to an overall view about the quality of leadership and the quality of, of the combined entity. And that uh, becomes a very useful general piece of information. But we know, of course, that a hospital that gets a, a good rating may have some areas that are less good and some areas that are better but it gives you an overall picture of the quality of leadership in an organisation if you come to that judgement. But the, the key insight from the King's Fund is that if you're going to do that aggregation, it shouldn't be done by a computer algorithm. It has to be done by someone who's looking at data and interpreting it and understanding it. And that's why we're trying to set up these processes. I appreciate it's an ambitious undertaking and we will... We'll approach it with with Would due. It involve local inspections. Is it just people sitting in a uh, committee room in London, or are they actually going to go out and, um, uh, um, you know, in an Ofsted start inspect? Well, we looked at the um, whether we should, you know, completely copy the CQC system, and we decided actually that we go for a lighter touch system, which doesn't involve those inspections, but might involve uh, contact to try and understand various trends or particular circumstances or challenges that people are dealing with. Um, and it's going to be repeated annually, which the CQC inspections aren't, so that if someone gets a disappointing score, they, they can correct it quickly. And it, so it's a slightly different process, which we thought was more appropriate. And then, um, sorry, I'm just trying to remember the, question, the other question on mental health provisions. It was a bit connecting up across the range of services, services social, social services, housing, etc. Oh, yes, indeed. Very important. So I think that is going to be one of the very big changes because I think one of the, the key things that uh, we need to develop both at a CCG level and at a GP level is, is proper stratification of patients. And as we stratify patients into different groups um, and start to understand the patients with the greatest need, I think we will understand the need for looking at their situation holistically. And I've seen this happen, actually, in parts. I saw in, in Greenwich a fantastic example of someone who they discovered that the biggest user of ambulance services in Greenwich, um, who was, I think, calling the ambulance service six times a week on average over a six-month period, uh, they basically uh, identified that in fact he had a gambling problem and that they were able therefore to correct that issue and reduce the ambulance use. So I was he I gambling on how quickly the ambulance would, come, <laughs> would arrive? Um, I'm not going to make any comments about, uh, about the London Ambulance Service, but, um, but I mean, I think the, the, 
point is very, very well made. And I think if we move properly to accountable care and population health, we'll have many more of those kinds of discussions happening. And Cathy Warwick, Royal College of Midwives, thank you very much for that. I really like what you're saying about personal uh, women-centred care. I just also really like that you mentioned the time gap. Um, that's what midwives tell us, is most affecting their ability to give high quality care at the moment. And it's great you're starting with GPs, but I just wondered whether there was a plan for the other sectors to really help us think that one through. Um, well, I'm absolutely um, very, very much up for that. And I think that there's a, you know, a really interesting example of of how we, can, uh, how we need to think carefully about that issue when it comes to midwifery, which is that you know, we all want to reduce uh, maternal harm and maternal death and infant death and stillbirths, and we're all aware of the need to make a lot more progress in that. Um, and a lot of that is going to be being better at sharing data between hospitals and learning from best practice and indeed learning from where things have gone wrong much more quickly than we currently do. But of course, that does mean inputting data more quickly. And that's where we've got to be really careful to get this balance right. And so I, and I think that's a, a very interesting thought. And I'd be very happy to take away how we could perhaps extend that to midwives. Right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid we've run out of time. We have um, a drinks reception at the back. Um, when you've um, uh, uh, um, uh, had your chat and you want to make your way, if I ask you to leave via these doors, but can we thank Secretary of State again, please? <laughs>